if some of us men are looking somewhat lost, it's because our wives, or some of our wives have gone to the women's retreat. So um, <clears throat> do remember them in prayer. Uh, we, um, we have much to be grateful for with our women folk, whether they're wives or daughters or, or sisters or friends, and they bring um, a, a degree of, of kindness and compassion that sometimes um, we men find a little bit difficult to express. So just remember them, that God would indeed, uh, as Aaron has prayed, uh, know, um, bless them and that they would be refreshed uh, and encouraged in the Lord and that that might overflow to others here. I wonder if you could turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I thought we would finish off the chapter. We, we started off uh, last, no not last week, a couple of weeks before um, and we were focusing mostly on verses um, 1 through to 10, uh, in particular remembering uh, the state that we were in, every one of us, um, <clears throat> which were dead in sin, um, so dead, you might say, that there was nothing we could do to um, bring life back to ourselves. In fact, that's one of the characteristics of being dead, isn't it? This was reinforced to me again uh, in this last week. I was speaking with someone and just the, the significant difference between so many worldviews and, and faiths, if you like, and beliefs and, and what Christ, uh, God has revealed through Christ. Pretty much everything else... Uh, relies upon us somehow or another bringing ourselves out of that state of deadness and bringing us to a place of life and we can't do that and the more we live the more we, we become conscious that uh, there's absolutely nothing we can do and as it's described later in this chapter we have no hope without, without God in this world and, and just speaking with this person uh, it the realisation came anew that there are so many people there who are, are thinking uh, and, and maybe even trying to do something to balance the ledger, to perhaps uh, get a sufficient degree of credit with God and imagine we who are, are broken and fallen and uh, without any possibility of reaching the standard for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, and yet we, we somehow have the arrogance to think that, that maybe with that effort I can, I can get things right. And so people strive. And then within the body of Christ's believers, we sometimes fall into that way of thinking, don't we? We think that God will... Make, uh, somehow we make ourselves more acceptable to God because of the efforts that we make. And we saw that verse, that wonderful verse, uh, two, verses, verses 2, 8 and 9. We'll just read them. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we thought about that, the grace and the faith and God and came to the conclusion that it's actually not the faith per se and the grace that saves us, it's God who saves us. It, God saves us because of the character of grace. Now, we can't understand that, but because of God's grace, he saves us, and we experience the benefits, the realisation of that by faith. So faith is not a work. We saw that. In fact, it says it in the next verse, doesn't it? It's by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet sometimes we even fall into the, 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 this, somehow this sense that we're gaining merit by faith. But we're not gaining any merit at all by faith. Faith is the, the, the drowning man crying for help. 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what faith is. It's not somehow a wonderful work. And so we came to that conclusion. So this was how, in God's purposes, this is how we've been brought into the body of Christ. This is how we've been made his children. And earlier on it talks about us being adopted into his family. We're family members together. And there was no other way that it could happen. There's no other doorway in. And so you've got this this body. And we're going to think about that body now. That's where Paul's uh, uh, Paul's thinking shifts now. He shifts from what Christ has actually done and our response to what has actually occurred because of that. And in particular, he looks at the division, the, the, the separation, not only between man and God, but between man and man, and in particular between the Jew and the Gentile. And that was perhaps a division that was as severe as any other division that existed in that day. So let's just read from verse 11 uh, to the end of the chapter. Uh, It would be good just to read that. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made by the blood, made nigh, sorry, by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, of two, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we have both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers, that's the Gentiles, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. One of the... The Lord accomplished many things when he gave his life on the cross, bore our sins. He, he, he dealt with enmity. He dealt with separation. Death in itself is a separation. And we know that he dealt with the separation of man with God. So one of the consequences of trusting Christ, of crying out to him, we, we understand has been reconciliation with God. We're right with God because of what he's done. And here he's painting the picture that not only... Is there a division between man and God? But there's also a division between man and man, and we see it everywhere. And in particular here, there's this division between the Jewish people and the Gentiles, the Jews and the Gentiles. And so he says, you remember, he's speaking to the Ephesians, that in time past you were Gentiles in the flesh, you were called uncircumcision by that which is called Circumcision in the flesh made by hand. Circumcision was given as an outward sign of a person belonging to the people of God. Of course, the Jewish people made much of this. In fact, they made so much of it that they came to think of it as some wonderful meritorious thing 
To have been a Jew, to have been circumcised, placed one above the dogs and the rest. And so here he's saying, you people who were called uncircumcision, you're uncircumcised, you're outside of the the people of God. In fact, remember that the first people that were coming to Christ were Jewish people. The gospel first came to the first to the Jew and then to the Greek. And, and so as these people came to believe in the Messiah and experience the salvation of God, for many of them, they, they felt, genuinely thought, that, that this salvation was not really for the Gentile, not the Jew. So they, st- they started to think of, of, the, of being circumcised as a necessity. Right? And what, what Paul's describing here and what he explains and what he calls the mystery in the next chapter is that, no, that's not so. That's not so. It's not about becoming or being a Jew and then being saved. It's really, it's the same. We're all under sin whether Jew, whether Gentile, whether circumcised, whether uncircumcised. The way in is back in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, regardless. And, and so he, as the apostle of the Gentiles, was, was explaining to them and telling them that this, this, this wonderful mystery of the gospel that regardless of whether you're uncircumcised or circumcised, you could now be brought into this one body. And so you who were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, you very people who weren't even called the people of God, you in fact have an opportunity. You can have a hope. Isn't, isn't God wonderful? He, he did choose Israel as a special nation. They were his chosen people. There's no question about that. And he orchestrates and works his plans amongst the nations. But when it comes down to the individuals, whether Jew or Greek, there is no difference. Whether you were a Jewish David or whether you were a Moabitess Ruth, or whether you were the, the harlot Rahab, it was all the same. Herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so Paul's saying, having cried out to the Lord, having submitted myself unto him, we're now being brought into one body and we've been reconciled. And look at the words he uses. He, he says, you in Christ, you who were sometimes far off and made nigh. How? By the blood of Christ. Not by becoming a Jew and somehow going through that ritual of circumcision. You were made nigh by the blood of Christ. The same way, by the way, that the, the Jewish people were made nigh. By the blood of Christ. And, and then it goes on to say, he is our peace. He's made both one. He's broken down the middle wall of partition. And boy, there was a middle wall. He wouldn't, couldn't even eat with them. There was a middle wall. And he's made them into one. And he abolished, in verse 15, in, the, in his flesh, the enmity. So, you know, I'm, you can have a wall... We have a fence between a na- my neighbour and myself, um, and that's, that separates us, in a sense. They do their things in their yard, and we do things in our yard. But, but having the wall doesn't necessarily mean I'm enemies with my neighbour. <laughs> but here, the wall it's describing is not only it's not only that there's a separation, and we each go our own way. There was an enmity between the Jew and the Greek. And by the way, there was an enmity between me and God in Romans chapter 5, who commended his love towards us in that while we were yet 
sinners, Christ died for us. So not only when we think of the wall, we don't think just of as a kind of a division where we each do our own thing. We're talking about a separation and an enmity, a hatred, a strife. And so there was this strife and there was this enmity between these uh, peoples, between these people. And, and then in verse 14, you know, it says Christ is our peace. And verse 15, he's abolished the enmity. And why, in verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. Wouldn't it be wonderful, a world without strife and fighting, and every day we face it. If you look at the news on a world scene, there is aggression and fighting uh, and, and destruction, but we don't have to look at the news, do we? On an individual level, we see it in our nation, we see it in our homes, we see it in our personal relationships, even amongst friends, we see it all the time. And there, there, the scripture tells us that there is no peace apart from Christ. You may not accept it, but that's the declaration of God. So if there is strife and trouble and difficulty, ultimately there's no way to deal with it unless Christ abolishes the enmity. Now I know here he's specifically talking about the enmity between the Jew and the Gentile, but it's the same. The very root of that hatred and bitterness and strife was the pride and the self-righteousness of these people. And Christ came and he abolished it. And again, he said earlier on in verse 13, it was by the, we made nigh by the blood of Christ. And here he reminds us again the how. He reconciled both to God in one body by the cross. The sacrifice was necessary. I was speaking to what someone uh, recently and, and they were saying, well, why God, if God is so great, he can just forgive and just exercise his mercy and say, that's okay. Well, God's not like that. God is a God of justice and holiness. He, he can't just sweep things away that are wrong. And we wouldn't want him to. Who would want to have a God who's, who's arbitrary with righteousness and justice? And that person gets punished, but no, it, it, it's okay here. We'll just let it pass. And if, if ever we doubt that God is serious about his justice, we go back to the cross. And we see it here again. It was by the cross, by the blood of Christ, that he dealt with and abolished the enmity. Now, they could have had a Camp David peace accord and tried to, you know, the Jews and Gentiles, to, <laughs> to get, deal with their differences. But that, that will never work. I'm not saying we shouldn't try and, and come to agreement about things at all. But I'm saying that that will never deal with the enmity. It will never deal with a petition. It will never deal with, with the strife and the brokenness. And the only thing that deals with it is the cross. And one of the things that happened, many things happened on the cross, actually, when he bore our sins, he, he paid the penalty, he expiated, he propitiated, and, and here it describes it as he slew the enmity thereby. The very root, the very division that separated them and us was dealt with by the cross. And though in verse, so, so he goes on in verse 7, and he came and he preached peace to you, both you who were afar off 
and to them that were nigh. So uh, you, you need to remember that the Jewish people, as the people of God, were thought of in this sense, that they were nearer to God. They did have the word, the scriptures, and when he talks about those who are far off and those who are nigh, it's another way really to talk about those who were the people of God, Israel, and those who were not. And again, isn't it? God is impartial. Now, we blame him for a lot of things. Uh, We don't thank him as we should, but we blame him for so many things. And yet it's very clear that regardless of where the person comes from, God deals with them impartially. And the way back to him, the way that we have access to him is by the blood of Christ and by the cross. What has he done? Ephesians 4.4 4 says he's created one. It's interesting, it says here, to reinforce this one, there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Ephesians 4, 5, uh, 5 and 6, who is above all and through all and in you all. There were two, in fact there were many, scattered groups, people who were at enmity. Here there were the, particularly the Israel and the Gentiles, and he's made it into one body. Now how many is one? One is one. Isn't it sad? One of the themes in the scriptures, in the, in the New Testament epistle that comes up time and time again is the theme of unity. Not uniformity, unity. Or to put it on the negative side, it's the theme of division. You see, there are differences amongst us all. When we come to Christ, we're brought into how many? One body. So what do we go about and do? So often, I put myself in the same basket, we go about and decide to divide up the one, don't we? When you read on here and he's describing the church, which is what he's describing in in chapter 2, Verse 19, uh, and let's just read that. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. How many households? One household of God. And that you're all built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ him being the chief cornerstone. How many cornerstones? One cornerstone. One foundation in whom all the building, fitly framed together, grows to a holy, how many temples? One temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation, not habitations, a habitation of God. Reconciliation by its very nature means to bring together and to break down the enmity. And having broken that down, having created the body, the one body, the one household, we read, he he refers to it as well um, in verse 19, your fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. It's not many households, it's one household. Why am I stressing this? You see, we've come to think in our minds very much, I believe, and, and in our lives of the churches. It's an unfortunate term, in fact, church. Uh, um, what do you think about when you think of the word Church. This meeting here? We do. We all probably know that church means assembly or congregation. That's why I like the word congregation. So 
So the word church was just a word, ecclesia, which, which, which just meant a group of people, generally with a common purpose. And, and sometimes it would refer to groups that met in particular places as the churches. Groups. Because when we think of church, we, we usually think, now, if you don't think this way, I'm, I apologise, but I often have that association with church meaning organisations. So we have the Baptist church and we have the Presbyterian church. We have the charismatic churches. We have the Church of England, etc., etc., etc. So here, he doesn't talk about all of that. He, he says there's this big hole and inside of that is the household of God the household and outside of that and if there's to be separation it's to be with the separation with the outside come out bring me out from among them and be ye separate so you separate yourself from sin You don't restore the partition that's been broken down. He put it this way, in 1 Corinthians 12, where there's a description of all the different members and parts, in verse 25, he says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Now, we often read that as, well, that means no schism in the body, that is South West Baptist Church, or North Side Baptist Church, or such and such Church of Christ. But no, he's, he is talking about the church at Corinth, but he doesn't want any schism in the body the one body because we're fellow heirs see it doesn't matter if I, when I, tra- if I travel to, I'll be travelling to Canberra this week if I meet a, a Christian there, a believer we're fellow heirs we're in the one body, we're in the one family now we might be different colours, we might even speak a different language so it's hard to talk we might go to different denominations We might even have differences of view about things. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't study the scriptures and and seek to understand the truth and hold to the truth. But remember, the way that we got into the body was not by having a particular view of Calvinism or Arminianism. That's not how we got in. It wasn't about having a particular view about premillennialism or postmillennialism. Now, I, I do have some considered views on that. And I'm not saying it's unimportant to think about those things. But how did people get in? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. They came in by grace through faith. They came in by submitting and trusting, not in a teaching, but in the person. And here's the mystery. Have you ever thought about what is the mystery of the gospel? There's a few mysteries in the scriptures, but have a look at chapter 3. He, he, Paul says this. Um, uh, he, he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for, the, for you Gentiles because he was the apostle of the Gentiles, verse 1. He said, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, would, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. Uh, what's the mystery? He says, Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now this mystery in verse 5, which in ages... Uh, past was not made known to the sons of men. It was not known. It was hidden. As it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this is the revelation. Nobody could have figured this out. 
This is the mystery of the gospel, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Isn't that wonderful? Now, there was a precursor. I guess uh, they knew even back in Genesis that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was faith. It was faith. But here is the mystery where he elaborates and says, look, regardless of the fact that God's used these people, the Jews, regardless of the fact that there are nations all over the place with all their differences, regardless of that, here's the mystery that in God has made one family, one household, one body, And he's made it by the cross, by his blood. And the entrance is the same for all. Am I saying we should never have differences or discussions or disagreements or different... Not at all. If you were come into our family, you would find there's plenty of differences. There's f- plenty of discussion. There's pr- plenty of variation of views. But you see, there's one common life. We're all members of the same family. And that's the division. So when he talks about unity, he doesn't mean uniformity. He's saying, recognise you're in the same family. You're in the same household. So don't create the divisions. Someone I love very much, um, many years ago, would remind us as young men that God loves the church, the church, and so should we. Whether it's a, a persecuted brother in Iraq or Syria or Iraq, of who would care what denomination? Who would care? Or whether it's our our brethren down the road in another church, or whether it's some stranger you meet who loves Christ, we've been brought into the one body. One body. You imagine how it works in your household, and remember it's called a household of God here. It's the household of God. If within that household you, you, you get one member starting to slander the other member, and create trouble, and then go outside and, and, and tell everybody how this, this brother or sister you know, did this, that, and the other, and don't like them. You know, what, what's it doing? It, it's, 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 it's restoring the division and the partition that was there already. It's restoring it. Now, I don't think I'm saying anything that's not here in this passage. God made it one. We can't make it multiple. We're not like an organisation. Now, of course, we do have different... We can't live in the same place. I mean, there's millions of Christians. You can't get them in one room, can you? And so the Christians in the early church, how would they meet? Remember, they're a a family, a household. They might meet in a home. They might meet in the catacombs at some stage. But, you know, it wasn't the meeting place. It wasn't even which people managed to get together. It was the consciousness that we're all part of this one family, one body. Sometimes some family members are away. 
They might be travelling. Well, they can't get together. But we're the one body. Now, let me ask you, and this is not a criticism at all, but for all of us to think, do we think of ourselves in this congregation as part of a family? What would that mean? What would it mean to be part of a family? How would I treat one another? And look, I do see, you know, there's some wonderful examples of of men and women here who treat one another with kindness and with love. And we don't all express it the same way. We're not all kind of lovey-dovey type. <laughs> so, but, but people do take an interest. And they may sacrifice and give up things for someone else or pray for them. See, in a family household, don't you think about your brothers and sisters and parents? You know, they're on your mind, even when you're not with them. Don't you have an interest or concern? And I I guess, you know, there are schisms in families as well, but in a family that is a family the way we know it should be, isn't there a care for one another? That would be the case. And I suppose one of the difficulties we have sometimes is that, you see, we have a preacher up here and we have a congregation down there and we don't always feel like we can all participate in the, in the life. But it's a family. Every conversation, every interaction is a family interaction. It's part of the body. I don't know that the, that the early church necessarily had a pulpit like this and somebody up front preaching to somebody down there. I don't know. I know they shared the word. Maybe it was less formal. I don't know. But it really doesn't matter. It's really about the heart. How do I... How, do we think of ourselves sitting here in nice rows <laughs> like this? Do we think of ourselves as part of a family? With all its strifes and troubles and, we, and, and sometimes there's reconciliation needed and, and sometimes we just need to put our hand on someone's shoulder and encourage them a bit and, and sometimes we have to ask forgiveness. And, but you see, it's not an organisation. It's a family. And sometimes people may come here occasionally and not all the time and for various reasons. They're not here punctually every week. They're still part of the family, you see. It's the same family. Same love. We love God because he loved us and we love one another. Ephesians 1.15, look how Paul expressed, he said, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, love, I cease not to give thanks. He was seeing in this church the love. He was in prison at this time. Unfortunately, 40 years later, this congregation had lost its first love for Christ, possibly was losing its first love for one another as well, I don't know. But, you know, we, we love one another because we love God. The two go together. And, and so here was this characteristic of love, of interest. Um, Lovely verses in chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, speaking the truth in love so that we might grow up in him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, one body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part making increase in the body unto the edifying of itself in love, the building up in love. That's a family thing. It's not an organisational thing. It's a family thing. It's a relational thing. Do you know that every time you meet with another believer and have a cup of coffee or whatever with them, you're part of the family? The Lord is there. We're his body. Who is it? 
whenever we meet as a group like this. It's, it's part of his one temple of God. There's a man called John Fawcett, a, co- uh, a convert of George Whitfield. And he became a Methodist and then he became a Baptist and <laughs> he moved around a bit. And he was uh, in a congregation that God had led him to. And he had a better offer, <laughs> a church in London. And he took, signed up for it and everything was going to go. And then I guess he had a sense of family. And he decided that um, chasing a bigger congregation was not what God had called him to. So he returned and lived and ministered in this place. And he wrote this hymn, which I'll try to read, and many of you will know it. And we haven't got it in the book, so we can't sing it. But He said, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred vines is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathising tear. When we are called to part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. This glorious hope revives our courage by the way while each in expectation lives and waits to see the day. From sorrow, toil, and pain and sin we shall be free and perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity. We're not there yet, but hey, we could practice, can't we? I'm not saying we're not practicing, but remember, it's not just about that blessed tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. It, it starts here, but it's, it's everywhere in every arrangement. It's not about agreeing with everybody on everything, but it is about exercising love for our fellow household members, for our fellow believers. May God give us a greater sense of his love and a growing love for one another. As Paul prayed for the Thessalonians, who loved, who did love, and yet he said and he prayed that their love would abound the more and more for this one body. Let, let's just pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, um, we're so far off from where you would have us to be, and yet we're so grateful that um, the household and the body, uh, this family exists not of our own making, but because of the cross and by the blood of Christ. And so we thank you that the work that you've begun, you'll finish. Pray for each uh, dear person here uh, this morning and for others that we know uh, who are part of the the family, that we would uh, grow in... Uh, that concern and interest. Lord, we can't know everybody and, and, and relate to everybody, but as you open doors and opportunities that we do relate to one another, may we um, better learn what it is to live together as a body, as a temple, indwelt by God himself and with a growing love for one another that reflects the love of God. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.